Today we're in the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. We're in chapter 13. I encourage you to have your Bibles open up to Luke 13. I'm looking at verses 10 through 17. Short little story, but a very important one. So why don't you stand with me, and we'll read the Word of God together. We'll pray, and then we'll look at this text together. Luke 13, starting at verse 10, says this, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he said, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on one of them, not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan is bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the glorious things you have done through Jesus Christ. I thank you for the freedom, for the liberty that you have given us in him, the fact that you have loosed us from the bonds of sin because of the things Jesus has done. What a joy it is to serve our Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that you would teach us through your Spirit-inspired word today. Speak to our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We talk about freedom. We talk about what we would give give for it. Uh, we think of uh, soldiers and sailors, marines, airmen. I don't think I left anybody out. They regularly offer up their lives for the sake of freedom. We, we venerate it in our songs. It's immortalized in movies, and people say, you know, we instinctively we would die for it, and perhaps many would. What is it? Uh, last week, of course, uh, Monday was Memorial Day. Our nation is supposed to pause and remember those who have died in military service. Typically, it's a long weekend used for movie openings and hamburger uh, cookouts. Is freedom simply the ability to do what we want, eat what we want, and enjoy our leisure time? Or is it something more? Understand that without context, the type and term of freedom is meaningless. The word implies that we're free from something. A POW experiences freedom when he or she is released from captivity. A slave experiences freedom when he or she is emancipated. What is it from which we have been freed? At the founding of our nation, our nation experienced freedom when it became independent from the kingdom of Great Britain. Men and women in uniform fight to maintain that freedom. To this very day. That's on a national level. What about individuals? Are we truly free? After all, there is a kind of bondage that exists beyond national citizenships. Do we, who supposedly live in the freest nation on earth, do we actually experience real freedom from day to day? I would say perhaps no. And you look around, you see addiction that runs rampant among us, be it in the form of alcoholism, drug abuse, pornography, even more benign things. People get addicted to food, sports, screen time on the internet. By definition, by the way, addiction is slavery. Paul wrote this in Romans 6.16, 6, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? What is it that we obey? That thing is our slave master. It may be pleasure, it may be pride, but whatever it is, it has our trapped. What do we need in that case? We need freedom. And where is freedom found? It is found in Christ Jesus. Jesus gives us freedom. And in fact, if you just go on to the next couple of verses, Paul went on to say that thing. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. We are set free when we became a slave of King Jesus. He delivers us into his kingdom to be his servants, to be his citizens, and that's when we are truly free. You say, that's a great teaching, but what does any of that have to do with our text today? It has everything to do with our text, because Jesus encounters a woman in bondage, and he sets her free. 
And instead of rejoicing in the miracle, a religious leader declares that he'd rather see her bound. And Jesus calls out that legalism for what it is, hypocrisy. Jesus came to set people free, and we are to remain in his freedom. Now, coming into this section of chapter 13, it may seem like it has little or nothing to do with what came before, but that's really not the case. Granted, chronologically, it's hard to see how all this necessarily fits together. Thematically, it fits perfectly. To get to the full picture of it, you really have to go all the way back to the end of chapter 11, beginning of chapter 12, because Jesus had called out blatant hypocrisy among the scribes and the Pharisees. He called them out on it, declared woe to them because of it. They had burdened the people, gave them no help in lifting that burden. Chapter 11, verse 46, they had taken away the key of knowledge to the kingdom. They neither entered themselves, nor did they allow others to go in either. 11, verse 52 Jesus then warned the multitude against that kind of sin, calling it the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, chapter 12, verse 1. And he taught the people from that point on, we saw over the last several weeks, they need to be ready for the judgment of God to keep humble and repentant hearts. But after all of that, Jesus now finds this religious leader that exemplifies the Pharisaical hypocrisy he had earlier condemned. And this man did the opposite of everything that Jesus just got done teaching about being ready to face the judgment. He had not prepared himself for judgment. He had not discerned the signs of the times. And on top of it all, he's willing to let another person suffer just to satisfy his own legalistic religious interpretations. And Jesus doesn't put up with it. Jesus came to give true freedom, and that's a freedom in which we can rejoice. So we start with the miracle in verse 10. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. If you follow along in a study Bible or any sort of thing like that, you'll note, a lot of scholars note, that this is the last time that Luke shows Jesus teaching in the synagogue, which is perhaps true, but I think it misses the forest for the trees. Because the point isn't that this is the last time he was teaching in the synagogue, it's that he was teaching in the synagogue. He had not yet been totally rejected by the Jews. He has an active, extremely active teaching ministry. This is part of his normal, regular practice. As a Jew, Jesus was in the Jewish synagogue every Saturday as a part of the normal Sabbath observance. And as a rabbi, it was common for him to be asked to teach the gathered congregation, even though it wasn't his hometown. Uh, We see it all the time, even today, not too unlike a traveling missionary or pastor going through town and invited to come forth and, hey, give us a greeting from where you're at or give us a a teaching, what what have you been learning, what have you been seeing? We might see some of that today. Of course, Jesus probably gave the entire message any time he spoke, right? Well, so far, so good. All of this appears to be normal, and really, that's the idea. As Luke starts telling the story here, he's painting the picture of just another Sabbath, just another synagogue. Of course, nothing about Jesus' ministry is just another anything. But what would happen next, that would mark the day as being drastically different. Look at verse 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Where did this woman come from? How long has she been there that day? How long has she been coming to the synagogue? Uh, We don't know really the answers to any of those questions. On one hand, it sounds as if she just suddenly appeared, but this is probably a rhetorical device Luke is using just to draw attention to her. Jewish women commonly attended synagogue services at the time, so the presence of the woman, that's not the unusual bit. What stood out from this woman, pardon the expression, is that she could not stand. And Dr. Luke, being the physician, points that out. He describes her as having a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. We don't know the diagnosis that she would have had. Uh, It could have been something that's called a skur or skyerman's kyphosis. Um, Had to look that up myself. Had no idea what that was. It's similar to scoliosis. We're familiar with scoliosis with the spine being being, bent in an unusual way from side to side. But in Kyphos, the, the spine is bent forward. And perhaps the more crude name for this, more common name, is the hunchback or humpback. That seems to be the situation this woman had. In the case of kyphosis, by the way, it commonly shows up during the teenage years, adolescent years. It is correctable if it's caught early enough. But it isn't difficult to imagine a situation in ancient Judea where a teenage girl contracted the condition and remained then with her for 18 years following. And if that's the case, she's probably in her early to mid-30s at this point, maybe even the same age as Jesus in the room, probably never wed due to her condition. 
by any outside measure at this time, this is her life, and this is the way it's always going to be. She was trapped. She was in bondage. Have you ever felt trapped? For this woman, she was literally trapped inside her own body, locked into this terrible position. For us, captivity may or may not take physical form. There may be circumstances from which we cannot free ourselves, though there were no fault of our own. But that's the way it is. Other times, maybe we did do something. We just, though no matter what we do, can't shake ourselves of the, the label or the results. Uh, maybe, again, that bondage comes in the form of addiction. And with addiction, I, I truly believe 99% of the time it's something that a person truly, truly hates, but it's that 1% that keeps people coming back. They're trapped. What do you do? Well, you can't raise yourself up. You can't give yourself freedom. Somebody who needs freedom needs to be freed. We need someone to come and emancipate us. And there's only one person who offers that kind of hope. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us freedom from sin. He gives us freedom from our past. In Him, we have new life, new opportunities, new future. And it doesn't matter how long we've been trapped, be it eight months, eight years, 18 years, 80 years, Jesus offers freedom from all of it. It's interesting that Luke describes this woman as having a spirit of infirmity. Being a physician, we might expect a different diagnosis from the doctor, right? But Luke, I think, understands something that modern doctors sometimes forget. There is indeed a spiritual world, and we have a spiritual enemy who has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, John 10.10. 10. And Luke never describes this situation as being outright possession. That's not the picture he paints here. But there is no doubt of the devil's involvement. Jesus personally points this out, specifically points this out later on in verse 16. A woman or man doesn't have to be possessed by a demon in order to be afflicted by spiritual warfare. And we tend to think sometimes of these things as, you know, black or white, this or that kind of categories, but in reality, it's rarely ever that cut and dry. Physical ailments aren't always easily or even often separated from spiritual issues. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, what we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against rulers and principalities, spiritual forces, this is Ephesians chapter 6. Now, that doesn't mean that we avoid medical doctors, heaven forbid. <laughs> medical issues, we deal with them medically. We ought to be grateful for abundance of technology and knowledge and all sorts of things that's available to us. But we should not ignore the spiritual component either. So we seek medical treatment, yes, but we seek the Lord as well. We go to the hospital, but we pray while we're there. We ask for the elders of the church to pray with us, uh, anoint us with oil, according to James chapter 5. It's not an either or, it's a both and. Of course, when the Son of God, incarnate, is physically in the room, doctors are a bit superfluous. So this woman's plight you know, has gone unaddressed for 18 years by everybody else, but Jesus gives her her full attention uh, at the moment he sees her. Look at verse 12. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. He healed her. And that healing came immediately. He saw her. Jesus spoke to her. Jesus laid hands on her. Other points at other times in the scripture, any one of those acts would have been enough to physically and spiritually heal this woman. Of course, we know that the only thing truly required was the will of God, which Jesus obviously had. Everything else is an outward expression of that will. And Jesus gave that expression in abundance. This woman could have and would have just stood up with Jesus thinking towards her. But he wanted her to know why she now stood. Her new life and her healing was due solely to the grace of Jesus as poured out on her. There's no doubt about it. And what's her response? Well, it's only natural. She glorified God. Jesus performs this powerful act of healing, and the woman glorifies the Lord. You say, well, is that right or wrong? Because Jesus healed her. She's given glory to the Father. Does she not understand that Jesus is God? Well, maybe, maybe not. We don't know enough information here to determine whether or not she actually came to faith in Christ as being the Son of God at this time. There's no reason to assume that she did not, but it's impossible to say for sure. But regardless of that, to glorify God for the grace of Jesus is entirely appropriate. Jesus' own desire was to glorify His Heavenly Father. John chapter 12, verses 27 through 28. He wanted that. So we ought to do the same. Of course, being that the Son of God is the second person of the Trinity, when we give glory to God the Father, we are glorifying the Son. It's a mystery, but it's the right response, however we look at it. But we answer grace with what? Glory. 
Jesus showers us with grace, we give glory to God. Let me ask you if this is your reaction. If you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, if you believed on Him as crucified for your sins, risen from the dead, you know then you have received grace upon grace upon grace from Jesus. You have been, what, forgiven of traitorous deeds against God? You've been cleansed of your lust, you've been cleansed of your defilements, you've been brought into the family of God, you've been given an eternal inheritance with the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been given incredible, infinite blessings that you could not have possibly deserved, but God gave them to you. Why? Because He loves you and He gave you grace. What other response is there than praise and glorifying God? How can we keep silent in the face of grace? We glorify God. You know, the word used here for glory, um, the word we use when we say doxology, it comes from the same word. What do you do in the doxology? Uh, Well, sing, give praise. We magnify Him with our lips. We exalt Him in our hearts. Is this what we do when we come into a church service, a worship service? Do you come with the expectation of actively exalting the God who gave you grace Or do you just show up trying to get through the singing as painlessly as possible? (laughs) The reason we glorify God is because we get to glorify God. That is a privilege given to those who have been forgiven by Him. So guys, come with excitement and with anticipation, with joy that you get to sing to God and give Him praise. Now, obviously, that's not limited to singing. You praise God in your prayers. You exalt Him when you wake up in the morning, when you go do your daily exercise, when you're running your errands, when you commute, whatever you're doing, there's no limit. It's when you can consciously, intentionally, joyfully give God praise and glory. So we want to take advantage of every single opportunity that we have. Before we move on, notice how her healing is described. It's described as freedom. It says, woman... You are loosed. The word for loosed comes from a very common Greek uh, verb that can be translated a number of ways. This particular form is a strengthened form of the verb, and depending on the context, it could be rendered set free, released, pardoned, let go, dismissed. Figuratively speaking, symbolically speaking, it could refer to forgiveness. Somebody is loosed from the eternal consequences of, of sin. In this case, this loosing was literal and physical, right? But no doubt there were spiritual applications with her, just as there are with you and me. Again, as we mentioned earlier, with sin comes slavery. From slavery, we need freedom. Jesus releases us. He looses us from the power that sin holds over us. The cross and the resurrection are the declarations to us that those who have faith in Him have been loosed. Have you been set free? Are you living as if you've been set free? There's a big difference between those two questions. Because many Christians will say yes to the first, remembering a time that we consciously put our faith and trust in Jesus as Lord. We remember that time we gave our lives to Christ, yet from that point forward, faith can waver. There's other times that our lives appear to be just as much enslaved to sin as they ever were in the first place. And that's not what Jesus intends for us. What would have looked like for Jesus to declare this woman loosed. She thanks him for her loosing, and then she bends over again to walk out the door. It would have been ridiculous. And we'd shout at her, you've been freed, stand up straight, walk right. Why put yourself in that position any longer? The exact same questions could be shouted at us. We've been given freedom. We've been given liberty from sin from the Lord Jesus Christ. He's personally freed us from We know the eternal penalty that was due our sin. He's freed us from the power of sin that had over our lives. One day he's going to save us and free us from the very presence of sin as we stand face to face with him in heaven. We've been free. So stop stooping over as if you're enslaved. Stand straight. Walk tall. Walk rightly with God as he's intended and equipped you to do. Now this woman, she's overjoyed to be loosed, but not everybody shares her joy. Look at the criticism in verse 14. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. Now this weren't so common in the Scriptures, and sadly it wasn't so common among 
religious legalist among us today, this kind of response would be unbelievable. Because how could anybody possibly witness a miracle of Jesus and do anything other than rejoice? Yet not only does this man not rejoice, he does not glorify God, he gets mad. He answered with indignation. He answered with anger. This act of Jesus was an offense to him. What was Jesus' crime? He had healed on the Sabbath. Now understand, barely a hand was lifted. He touched her, but that was it. A word was spoken. What labor took place? Well, obviously an act of power had been performed, but this was intolerable to the synagogue leader. He demanded the strictest adherence to Sabbath day traditions. He even implies, do you know, sin on part of the woman. Saying you can come and be healed, passive, you can be healed on the other days of the week. As if, you know, if she'd shown up at the synagogue service for the specific purpose of making Jesus heal her. By the way, since when is being healed a work? She was the recipient of the miracle, not the giver of it. Even if we just put the focus here on the work of Jesus, is there any truth in what the synagogue ruler says? Was his complaint, though poorly worded, was it theologically accurate? Uh, well, the fourth commandment is pretty clear. We know the fourth commandment, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. Work can be done from you know, sundown Saturday to sundown the next Friday, but that final night and day were holy to the Lord, set apart by him. God rested on the seventh day, set it apart as holy. So, had Jesus broken the clear commandment? Understand that Jew, Jewish tradition divides work into 39 creative categories of things that are forbidden on the Sabbath. Interestingly enough, healing is not one of them. Uh, Jewish tradition even has a principle called pekuach nefesh, in which the preservation of human life overrides other religious considerations. So if there's an emergency, emergency workers can work to heal somebody. Now, this woman's life is probably not in immediate danger. She would lived with it for 18 years. But it's evident that things aren't nearly as cut and dry as the synagogue ruler implies here. Actually, the course of action that Jesus took is pretty clear. It just goes against what the religious leader wants. not favorable to his view. What are the issues here? There's legalism. There's a lack of love. And there's even a lack of the fear of God. Issue number one, legalism. Here's a guy demanding adherence to the letter of the law without any regards to the heart of it. And this is something that Jesus is going to address when he responds to him. It's not that God doesn't care about the letter of the law. He doesn't care about the details of his word. Of course he does. He values his word. But he also wants us to understand the heart and the spirit of the law. This is evident from Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus addressed the Ten Commandments. The law says you shall not murder, but Jesus said, you know, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment, Matthew 5, 21 and 22. The law says you shall not commit adultery, but Jesus said if we look on others with lust, then we've already committed adultery with that person in our heart, Matthew 5, 27 and 28. The heart of the law is for God's people to seek after God's righteousness, and that's something greater than traditions regarding the legal details of the thing. Well, it's the same thing here. The detail of the law is to do no work on the Sabbath day. The heart of the law is to sanctify the Sabbath to the Lord and to rest in Him. Jesus hadn't gone out and chopped wood. He hadn't engaged in any kind of physical labor that distracted Him from His worship of God, and it did, he had sanctified, he actively sanctified the Lord because the miracle that was performed was a reason for God to be glorified. This woman was now resting in the Lord because she had been freed from her infirmity. So the heart of the law had been kept to the full. It was the man's own legalistic interpretation of it, which was violated. As Christians, we need to be uh, careful of two dangers of legalism. Number one, that we not be burdened by it. And two, that we not engage in it. The first seems obvious. We see you know, the Pharisees around us and have a relatively easy time recognizing when somebody's trying to push their own expectations on us. Even so, uh, when they do so, we need not feel pressured. Now, if they confront us with uh, possible sin in our lives, we definitely need to examine ourselves, you know, look at our behavior in the light of Scripture, seek solid biblical counsel, go to God in prayer. But if it's all clean, then the legalism of others ought to be disregarded and seen for what it is. Jesus died to give us freedom from the law 
So we stand firm in that freedom, not allowing ourselves to be entangled again with a yoke of bondage, Galatians 5.1. So we're mindful of that danger. On the second point, we need to realize that Pharisees aren't always other people. Sometimes they can be us. Just because we have certain expectations for ourselves doesn't mean that the same expectations apply to everybody else. You know, one Christian believes that he or she should never smoke, drink, dance, get a tattoo. Are any of those things inherently condemned in the Scripture? They can be abused. They can be done in sinful ways, every single one of them. But the Bible does not comprehensively forbid any one of those things. By all means, hold to your convictions, but be careful when you expect others to hold the same ones. Issue number one was legalism. Issue number two is a lack of love. And this is something else that Jesus addresses in response. Because there had been a woman in need. Jesus had the power to do something about it. How could that not be celebrated? To condemn this miracle is to wish that this woman had remained in torment for at least another sundown, maybe even longer. After all, who knew what Jesus' travel plans were? This was a known itinerant minister going from place to place. Perhaps he was leaving in the morning or maybe even at sundown that evening. And from this woman's perspective, she might not ever have seen Jesus again. This was her chance at healing. And it was downright hateful for somebody else to hold her back from it, especially under the guise of false religious piety and custom. Loving hearts take people to Jesus, not forbid them from going. And Jesus calls us to love. We're to love one another, showing compassion on them like he has shown us. We are to model the love of Christ to all the world because if they don't see it in us, where are they going to see it at all? So that was the second issue, is the lack of love. Issue number three is the lack of the fear of God. Now, this isn't something that Jesus directly addresses, but it's certainly implied. How so? Because a miracle of God had been performed in front of everybody there. Every person attending the synagogue that day would have been astounded. Why? Because this woman wasn't a stranger to them. They had seen her for 18 years. Most likely, many of them knew her before the affliction took hold. They had witnessed her body slowly degenerate and hold her captive. Now in an instant, she stands upright, straight, under the miracle and power of God. She glorified God, all due to a man of God in their midst. This is a reason to worship, not condemn. God's hand was evident, yet the synagogue ruler thought he knew better. So he identifies the clear work of God as what? As sin, declaring it to be a violation of God's Sabbath law. Now that's within a hair's breadth as the same sin as the Pharisees blaspheming the Holy Spirit, declaring the work of God to be that of the devil. And it demonstrates that the synagogue ruler had no true fear of God before his eyes. He wasn't seeking to worship and to glorify God. He was looking to put down the work of God and elevate himself. And those who know Jesus ought to be able to recognize His work. Those who are filled with the Spirit, we ought to be able to understand the things of the Spirit. And that's not to say that we agree with everything that everybody does who does it under the name of Christianity. But we should still be able to rejoice when the things of God do occur. You know, there are are TV evangelists that are outright heretics. I believe they should never be given a platform anywhere. But you know, sometimes people still get saved at their meetings. In spite of the speaker in front of the microphone, we can rejoice in the work of God even as we denounce the false teaching. Whatever the example, we need to recognize God's hand when it moves and give Him the glory. We seek Him. We seek His kingdom, not our agenda, not our sensibilities and preferences. So what's Jesus' response? Well, we see this starting in verse 15. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it. Before we get to the details of the response, notice how Luke describes the manner in which Jesus responded. The Lord then answered him. This kind of spiritual abuse and manipulation handed down from the synagogue ruler is not ignored by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Messiah is in the room, the Son of God is in the room, and he's going to respond with all the truth of God, all the canons of God aimed back at this man. And what was the charge? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, just like the lawyers who took away that key of knowledge from the masses stood in front of the door of the kingdom, so did this ruler do here with this woman in the synagogue. Just like the Pharisees, you know, they speak one thing in the open and another thing behind closed doors, chapter 12, 1 through 3. 
This man did the same thing because on one hand, the synagogue ruler holds himself up as this paragon of virtue, somebody who's truly caring about God and honoring the Sabbath rest. But on the other hand, he'd rather see a woman bound with sickness and he openly disparaged a work of God in his midst. He was a hypocrite in true form. Someone who sincerely followed God in truth would have rejoiced at what had taken place, would have rejoiced in the one who performed the miracle. But as a hypocrite, he not only denigrates the miracle, he denigrates the miracle worker in the name of his religious piety. It's false piety, it's hypocrisy. Jesus calls it out for what it is. Now, once again, we need to be careful about pointing too many fingers because it is easy to look around and find religious hypocrites around us. And sometimes, you know, we almost make it a game seeing how many false teachers and hypocritical Christians we can point out by name, which itself is pretty dangerous in regards to hypocrisy. What we really need to be careful of is becoming hypocrites ourselves. We'll demand something of someone, but we have another expectation for ourselves. Or we slip in and out of church face, depending on what person we're talking to. We give ourselves grace while we push law on somebody else. It's hypocrisy. How do you deal with hypocrisy? Humility. Humility is the antidote to hypocrisy. Because people with humble hearts don't seek to exalt themselves, so there's no point to try to prove themselves right on. People who humble themselves, humble their hearts, seek to have the Lord exalted, so they're not trying to insert themselves along the way. When you see hypocrisy creeping up in your life, humble yourself before God. Recommit yourself to following Jesus as your Lord and King, allowing Him full reign in your life. Everything else tends to work itself out. What's the proof of the hypocrisy? And the proof was the, the Jews did less for livestock. Jesus had loosed a woman from her sickness, which was a gloriously good thing. How could that break the Sabbath when a basic example of animal husbandry was not? Culturally speaking, the Jews did not cook meals on the Sabbath, but meals, of course, were prepared beforehand, and they were eaten People did eat. They did not starve themselves. They did not fast from food and drink every Saturday. Neither did they force their animals to do so. You know, if you've got a milk cow, that milk cow needs to stay healthy to keep producing milk six days a week. Donkeys and oxen, they need to remain strong to be able to plow the fields and do farm work six days a week. Those animals still need to be fed and watered. Even if you leave hay out for them to eat, there's no violation of the Sabbath to lead them to drink. So this legalism of the, the, the synagogue ruler led him to ridiculous conclusions because if an animal could be loosed from a stable to be led to water, how much more could a human being be loosed from bondage to freedom? And that's what Jesus says in verse 16. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? If the ox or the donkey was loosed, this woman was loosed to an even greater extent for a greater reason, because at this point, an animal is no longer in view, but a human being. And more than that, and this is where the focus is, she's a daughter of Abraham. The focus isn't on her as a woman and her femininity. No, this is on her status as a child of the Abrahamic promise. She had inherent value even beyond her basic humanity. She was a spiritual sister to the leader of the synagogue who had condemned her. The man who had likely taught her of the blessings of Abraham, the synagogue ruler, should have seen her as a recipient of the covenant of Abraham. She too was included in the promise. She too had value. She was someone whom God loved, whom God had set apart as belonging to him. She ought to have been befriended by the synagogue ruler, not chastised by him. And this gets back to that lack of love that was so evident in the man's criticism. He hadn't seen the woman as he ought to have seen her. You know, when Jesus spoke of her illness, he literally said, behold, 10 and 8 years. Look on her. Think of it, right? This is how you translate, think on it. Look on her. 10 and 8 years she's been this way. Part of the problem is that he hadn't looked at her. For 18 years, she'd come to the synagogue, hunched in bondage and pain, and he hadn't taken notice of her condition. How callous it was for him to claim, there are six other days of the week on which you could be healed. She had come for 18 years and not been healed. This man hadn't looked at her. He had no compassion on her. He didn't value her as a person. He didn't value her as a daughter of Abraham. Now, the man in question is a ruler of a Jewish synagogue, but the same thing could be said 
easily of many modern day Christians. How often have we blinded our eyes to the people around us who are suffering and not just strangers, Christians showing preference to those in the household of faith, people we know. These people have value as men and women of God, their brothers and sisters in Christ. We can't always help them miraculously. We can see them and strive to see them through Jesus' eyes. We can look upon them with compassion and demonstrate grace. And even if all you can do is just pray for them, beloved, that's something. The opportunities we have to love one another are endless, but we've got to open our eyes, behold them, and look. And she was loose. What was this woman loose from? She was loose from satanic bondage. There was a physical illness experienced by the woman, but it doesn't mean Satan wasn't involved. Even if this woman wasn't demonically possessed, she was demonically oppressed. And it was from this spiritual satanic oppression that Jesus set her free. She was loosed from this bondage. She was released from spiritual and physical slavery. And the Sabbath day, guys, that was the perfect day on which to do it. Why? How so? Because the Sabbath is all about rest. On the Sabbath day, the seventh day, Jesus, God, rested from all his work in creating the universe. On the Sabbath, that's how we find and celebrate our rest in God. For the Jews, this was an outward sign of their covenant. and They show their trust in God as their provider. They rested in him and his promise every single week. Today, our rest is found in a, what, a 24-hour period? No. Is it found in a physical land of promise? No. The author of Hebrews understood those things don't bring true rest. In fact, he said, Hebrews 4, 9 and 10, there therefore remains a rest for the people of God because Joshua hadn't brought them into the rest when he brought them into the promised land. Verse 10, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his how then do we enter the rest of god when we rest in jesus by faith when it comes to the work of salvation jesus has done it all what did he declare from the cross to tell us die it is finished john 19 30 there's nothing we can do to add to it there's nothing we can do to make it more it is complete it is done it is perfected So we rest in Him. We place all of our faith, all of our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on Him for salvation, and thus we find our salvation. That's when we enter His rest. And that's what makes the Sabbath a perfect day for a daughter of Abraham to be loosed and find freedom. Because she's no longer bound by Satan. She's no longer oppressed in her body. She's no longer oppressed in her spirit by the devil. She's loosed from bondage. She can find freedom given her by Christ. That's not a violation of the Sabbath. That's the fulfillment of it. And everybody can experience that same fulfillment. Anyone, everyone is invited to rest. Jesus offers his rest. And if that's you, stop struggling to free yourself from sin and bondage. Stop working to try to prove yourself worthy of eternal life. Rest. Place your faith in Christ. In Jesus' rest, there is freedom. Verse 17, When he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So this is quite the turnaround. Ruler of the synagogue, originally, you know, he turned a moment of joy and glorifying God into an uncomfortable moment of awkwardness because he's accusing Jesus and this woman of sin. But now Jesus responds, the table turns. Now it's the synagogue ruler who is put to shame. And notice he wasn't alone. Luke only recorded him speaking, but apparently there were others who joined him in disapproval, adversaries, plural. So likewise, they joined him in public disgrace. The truth of God cut like a knife was exactly what it's supposed to do. It cuts to the heart and exposed this legalistic, hypocritical false piety for what it was. And those who held to it were put to shame. And everybody else who was in the room, all the rest of the crowd, The multitude, they rejoiced. Now, that was the response that should have come all along. This is what was begun by the woman, carried over by the crowd. They were witnesses to the miracle. They rejoiced and recognized it as a glorious work of God for what it was, and they praised Him. Do you rejoice in the work of God? Do you glorify God for the freedom He has given you? We may not have had our backs bent for 18 years like this woman, 
but we do know what it's like to be in bondage. Before we met Jesus in faith, every single one of us, we were enslaved by sin. We were the ones that were ruled over by the devil. We did the things of his will, and we engaged in the lust and rebellion of our own. But then we saw Jesus, we met Jesus, and what did Jesus give you? He gave me freedom. We've been loosed from slavery, pardoned from sin, released from the power Satan had over us. If you've been a believer in the Lord Jesus, you have experienced a legitimate miracle. You have experienced personal emancipation, and that's something for which you can praise God. So we praise Him. We give Him glory. We exalt His name. We thank Him for all these things He's done for us. Enjoy His freedom and stay in His freedom. Others might come with their own legalistic bonds, but don't you be entangled by them. Don't let them steal your joy. You have been set free to serve Christ, so serve Him. Not anyone else's expectations for you. It's not a license to sin. It's a liberty to live for Jesus. And we want to beware of the trap of legalism too. Don't want to think it's always somebody else. It's not just a danger to ensnare us, but it's a danger we might ensnare others. Be mindful that we point people to Christ, not ourselves. For some of you, who knows? I don't know. Hopefully nobody in this room is. But there may be somebody that's still entrapped in the slavery of sin, and and you know it. You've never experienced the freedom that Jesus offers. You can Jesus gives that offer to all the world. You can be free from bondage. And you can be free forever. But you have to receive His work, and you can do that right now as we pray. Father, thank You so much for sending Jesus for us that we can have freedom. Thank You for the wonderful things that He's done to make provision for us that we can rest in Him. And I pray, Lord, every single one in the sound of my voice today we would be resting in Christ, resting in the things that He's done for us because He has completed the work and He sets us free. But for any who have not helped them grab hold of Jesus, help them trust the work that He has completed on their behalf. Believing upon Jesus as the one crucified for them, risen from the grave, believing upon Jesus as the Son of God, help them entrust their entire lives to Christ as Savior and Lord. Be their King, Lord, and save them. For the rest of us, help us walk in freedom rejoicing, giving glory, giving doxology to the God who loves us and who saves us. Lord, we thank you for these things and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.